Right, thank you very much for this very gracious introduction. Thank you to Professor Steep and to the organizing committee. Thank you so much um, for um, the invitation to present here uh, as your keynote speaker. Uh, we, I'm going to have a lot of different slides for you today, about 180 in about 40 minutes. So please buckle up. Um, and without further ado, let's get going. So we have uh, 2 billion people worldwide affected by brain or, or central nervous system disorder, including 100 million in the US. Uh, in the United States, every 66 seconds on average, a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Uh, there are approximately 700,000 uh, 700, people dying every year with Alzheimer's in the US. And in fact, if we look at the, um, the projections, it appears that uh, people are getting Alzheimer's earlier. In other words, Alzheimer's is growing faster than the population is aging. By 2050, we will have about 13.2 million people uh, in the US with uh, Alzheimer's, and this is a uh, $1.1 trillion problem per year. If we look at Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and depression, and we multiply the incidence by the prevalence, uh, we end up with uh, the expected costs, which are in, uh, in, wh in white over here, but the, the actual costs are much more significant per year. So, but you know, nearly half, half a trillion for Alzheimer's, uh, over 50 billion for schizophrenia, and over 200 billion for depression per year. And these are diseases that affect the caregivers as well. So over 60% of caregivers have a confluence of symptoms, including depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, diabetes, compromised immune system, uh, and they actually uh, tend to uh, live not as long as uh, peers of the same age group who are not caregivers. Half of the people satisfying the, the diagnostic criteria for dementia have never received the diagnosis. And the, the same is true also for depression. In fact, for depression, we know that there are also a lot of false positives. So between 60 and 75% of people who pursue treatment for depression may be paying for unnecessary care. Uh, if we look at Parkinson's, uh, though there are only about 1 million people in the US who have it, it's a $25 billion problem per year. And the kinds of tests that people have to undergo uh, are quite varied. And the problem is, of course, that the false positive rate uh, at the onset is about 35%. And after this battery of diagnosis, it's only about 24%. So this is very time consuming and very costly. Uh, some people think that, you know, we should invest uh, more money in this kind of research. In fact, there is a, a joke by a Jewish comedian, David Minkoff, who says, there's no more money being spent on breast implants and Viagra today than on Alzheimer's research. This means that by 2040, there should be a larger elderly population with perky boobs, huge erections, and absolutely no recollection of what to do with them. Um, turns out that we're actually investing already quite a bit of money uh, in this kind of research. Uh, every year, we sacrifice about 100 million uh, vertebrates uh, across academia, government, and industry. We spend about $40 billion a year to do this. Uh, and the likelihood that we will actually have a drug that will uh, go to human clinical trials is a bit lower than 6%. Uh, unfortunately, once they reach these, these uh, clinical trials and if they pass uh, the clinical trials and they have the seal of the FDA, they're not always very um, safe. Uh, and some of them uh, have some major side effects. So this is a, a family portrait, which means I'm this little guy here, you know, uh, closer in size to the dogs. Uh, and my father actually abused a drug called Halcyon. I don't know if you are aware of this drug. It was the most prescribed sleeping drug of the late 1980s and the early 1990s. It was sort of the ambient of the time. Uh, it was an FDA approved drug until one found out that it caused all kinds of side effects, uh, which I include here. Again, an FDA approved drug. So the, the system that we have currently uh, has not taken care of all these things. We still have a number of drugs that uh, make it through the seal of the, the FDA, that receive the imprimatur of the FDA, and that are still uh, rather unsafe. So what is the big vision? What is this big goal? You know, if, if we're going into the world of big data with sensors everywhere, can we do better? Uh, Thomas Edison had a very interesting prediction. He said, the doctor of the future will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame and the cause and prevention of disease which I think is a very noble goal. How do we get there? How do we get from Halcyon to, to Edison? So we know that there are a number of things that we can do uh, in terms of our diet uh, that could also mitigate you know, uh, our, certain, our risk profiles. For example, we know that Parkinson's is 
um, has a very strong correlation with uh, dairy intake. We know that there are all kinds of dairy substitutes already. We know that uh, there is a very strong correlation between the, um, uh, the um, intake of red meat uh, and cancer. And we also know that there are all kinds of substitutes for uh, red meat, including at your airport, where I landed uh, in the middle of the night. I was delighted to find that you had uh, this here too. We know that a healthy diet can, can help prevent type two diabetes. We know that it can uh, help with uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, individuals who uh, take anticholinergics are uh, disproportionately more likely to develop Alzheimer's. So certainly uh, we can, we can uh, keep an eye on that as well. But these, all these things are you know, good to know, but how do we know that we ourselves are you know, likely to develop uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, et cetera? Is there a, a way that we can have access to uh, the brain um, in a more fundamental manner. So it turns out that if you have Alzheimer's depression or schizophrenia when you're awake, you happen to have Alzheimer's depression or schizophrenia when you're asleep as well. You may not have symptoms, but your brain activity is much more variable during sleep than during wakefulness. When you're awake, you have neurotransmitters that suffuse uh, the brain and everything is turned on, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, um, you know, uh, dopamine, everything is turned on. But when you're asleep, depending on which sleep cycle you're in, some of these neurotransmitters are turned on and some are turned off. And that's quite interesting because there isn't a, an isotropic um, distribution of receptors for these neurotransmitters, which means that this gives us the opportunity to actually study particular brain structures during sleep, potentially at home in your own bed uh, when, you, when you're sleeping. So let me give you a couple of examples of these, these um, uh, brain pathologies that are known to have uh, associations with disrupted sleep. We know that with schizophrenia, uh, there is a very uh, large percentage of individuals who will uh, have disrupted sleep, especially when it comes to sleep spindles that are between 12 and 15 Hertz and they're, they're seen in the EEG. We know that with depression, uh, for individuals suffering from acute depression are going to have quite a bit of insomnia, but if there is a, um, a chronic depression, those individuals will fall into REM sleep sooner and will stay in REM sleep longer. Uh, in fact, if 90% of Americans suffering from depression were correctly diagnosed, and if 80% of them were to get appropriate tre treatment, we would save about 330,000 human years of work uh, per year in the US. With Parkinson's, uh, we know that a, a, many uh, Parkinson's sufferers suffer from a um, disease called uh, RBD, REM behavior disorder. In other words, they lose the ability uh, to um, suppress their muscle tone during REM sleep. And that actually tends to happen years in advance of the Parkinson's uh, diagnosis very often. Uh, if you have Parkinson's, you have a one in three chance of suffering from RBD. And if you have RBD, you have a nearly 100% chance of eventually suffering from Parkinson's within 15 years. So this is a very, very specific biomarker. And in terms of the sensitivity, it's about twice the sensitivity of the most sensitive uh, genetic biomarkers right now, the Parkinson's pink genes. Uh, with Alzheimer's, we know that the first thing that goes wrong in these patients is their sleep. Uh, this here is called a hypnogram. It is a chart that tells us in what state the person is uh, during the night. So you've got wakefulness, REM sleep, uh, these light stages over here, intermediate stage two, and then these slow wave stages over here, which have since then been combined into just one stage, stage three. This is a typical uh, sleep uh, pattern where you have most of the, the, um, the, the deep sleep occurring early in the night. And then throughout the night, there's more and more REM sleep. Uh, if you look at the brain patterns or the sleep patterns of an individual with, with Alzheimer's, it looks very different. Uh, this individual here has no deep sleep, uh, very little REM sleep, and it wakes up all the time. If we correct for this person's apnea, you'll see that there is more REM sleep because the trachea doesn't collapse during REM sleep, and there's still very little slow wave sleep. Uh, this sort of makes sense because there is a, a, a theory uh, called the amyloid theory that says that the buildup of amyloid may be responsible for Alzheimer's. And there's another theory that, that suggests that during sleep, we actually evacuate a lot of the junk from the brain, a lot of the debris. So if we have disrupted sleep, it's possible that we have more of the amyloid buildup and that as a result, the likelihood that we develop um, uh, Alzheimer's is actually much greater. Uh, all these things have to be tested obviously uh, in greater detail, but there's some interesting leads. 
So this here is human EEG, right? Brain waves. Um, raise your hand if you see a difference between the left side and the right side. I just want to see how many liars there are in the room. Good, not too many. One. Okay, so what was. <laughs> So um, it turns out it's very difficult to see a difference between the left and the right side, right? But something fundamental has happened actually in this person's brain. Uh, that person has gone from REM sleep, uh, I'm sorry, from wakefulness to REM sleep, but it looks like the brain is doing exactly the same thing. In fact, we have to add channels, sensors on the neck and around the eyes to see that something fundamental has happened, right? This person has gone from wakefulness to REM, which by the way, is a very uh, unusual transition. Uh, but we wouldn't know it were it not for the addition of these sensors here, which is a big paradox. The sensors that are supposed to be the furthest away from the brain tell us the brain is now in a new state. Whereas the sensors that are supposed to tell us what the brain is doing are not showing any change. And this is why REM sleep has been called the paradoxical state. It looks like you are, uh, it looks like you are awake, but actually you are asleep. And because of this, uh, when people suffer from sleep problems and we bring them to the clinic, we turn them into pin cushions. We put electrodes all over their head and body. We rub the skin with an abrasive solution. We glue and tape these electrodes and all this to find out how they might sleep at home without any of these things. And, and so, you know, if, um, if you were to look for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in biology, that would be it. The more diseased the person is believed to be, the more sensors we put on that person, and the more we actually disrupt that person, and the more we contaminate the data that we're collecting. So what do finches and hawking have to do with any of this that I'm telling you right now? Well, it turns out they have a lot to do with it. So um, I started my career as a neuroscientist uh, over two decades ago, and I was interested in the sleep patterns of uh, zebra finches. They have a brain architecture that is completely different than that of mammals. And I want, was curious to find out what was conserved and what was different. And because they have a brain the size of a peanut, I had to mathematically extract as much data as possible from a very small footprint. So this is, these are these Australian zebra finches. Uh, they're very interesting birds. They have 90 days to learn a song and their song becomes the passport to territory, to mates and to food. Uh, and, it, and the reason I started that study was because it, it was discovered that these birds were rehearsing their song when they were sleeping, which was quite interesting. And we wanted to know if this was sleep state specific or not. The problem, however, is if one discovers a completely new you know, sleep state or a state that seems similar to, to others in a new species, there has to be a mathematically objective way to validate it. Otherwise it becomes a tautology. And as I was wrestling with this problem, I took a break one day and I went to uh, the Art Institute in Chicago and I was marveling at this painting, Un dimanche après-midi à l'île de la Grande Jatte by Georges Seurat. Uh, this painting is completely revolutionary. Uh, you know, we take it for granted right now, but Seurat pushed, um, uh, um, created pointeism. So he, he, he pushed, um, um, you know, he, 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 he painted these little dots here everywhere. And, and if you come close to the painting, this is all you see. Uh, but in fact, um, the statistical distribution of these dots gives us certain objects here. And so when I looked at this painting, I thought maybe this is the way we solve the brainwave problem. In other words, is it possible that we can just turn brainwaves into clouds and that the distribution of these dots gives us the brain states? And that was the, the, uh, the Eureka mo moment. So this here corresponds to a spectrogram, um, which is just, a, just a, a plot that tells us the frequency content across time in, in this case, brain waves. So if one were to do this with music, for example, if people next door were to play, you know, uh, the violin, which is high frequency, you would see things here, which would be light. And if they were to play the bass or something with lower frequencies, we would see activity over here, right? So if we look at this data, uh, it appears that most of the information is in low frequencies. But it turns out that if we, if we normalize the data across time, what we find is that there are statistically significant changes in the brain in very high frequencies that were missed before. 
And if we blow this, if we blow up two hours, we can see this here that there are basically periods where the low frequencies are dominating, and there are periods where the shifts in the high frequencies are actually dominating the shifts. So we're talking about relative power here. And in fact, we can create a completely new way of looking at the brain, um, uh, which, which I call here, you know, uh, dynamic spectral scoring or preferred frequency analysis. And here, what we do is for each point, uh, time point, we're going to represent the frequency which has the highest relative shift across time. So now you can see that at times when the lower frequencies are dominating relatively, and times when the shifts in the higher frequencies percentage wise are dominating. Uh, and, and of course, this is very sensitive. So it picks up on the 60 hertz noise in America and the 50 hertz noise uh, in Europe. Um, and, and it will pick up the noise in the Middle East as well, which is good. We want to be able to have a system that's very, very sensitive. But the key thing here is that by doing these types of analyses, we can find out what are the main frequencies that are changing and we can create filters now for each particular species or pathology that we're looking at. And we can now mathematically analyze the brain. So here we've got uh, a manifold. You have two planes. Every dot corresponds to three seconds of brain data uh, collected one second at a time. Deep blue corresponds to slow wave sleep. REM, which is perpendicular to it, corresponds to, uh, is in red here. And here we have uh, an intermediate sleep state, which had never, which is in science, that had never been discovered be before, certainly in birds. And this technique generalized very nicely in all the birds in the study. And uh, the human would score the data at a three second resolution, the algorithm at a one second resolution, and there was a very nice uh, agreement rate. And what it showed was something quite remarkable, which is um, if we combine the data across the birds, slow wave is decreasing throughout the night, REM is increasing throughout the night, REM length is increasing throughout the night, and the space between REM sleep is collapsing throughout the night. This is typical textbook mammalian sleep, even though these birds don't have a neocortex. Um, interestingly, the algorithm could give us the most representative epochs for each brain state. And so here you have raw EEG, three seconds at a time. And um, on, the, on the vertical, you have microvolts. So this is slow wave sleep. Over here, you see these beautiful delta waves. REM sleep, the eyes are moving. Intermediate sleep, we don't have these delta waves, the eyes are not moving. Wakefulness over here. Here, the uh, right eye is open, the left hemisphere is awake, the left eye is closed, the right hemisphere is asleep. Uh, birds and cetaceans are able to shut off half their brain. I guess some of you, you know, wish you could do this right now, but we, we can't because we have a big corpus callosum. Um, and interestingly, there is this, uh, this pattern here. This is called a K-complex. And this is very strange. This is a, a big peak-to-peak -peak depolarization. And when I showed this to Dr. Jean-Paul Speer at the University of Chicago, he said, I didn't know that you were working on rats. And I said, well, unless you think that, that, that you know, uh, rats are birds with feathers, I'm not. And this was very strange because Mircha Steriad in Quebec um, had shown that in fact, these patterns here had a cortical component. Um, and in fact, he showed something else, which was quite interesting. This by the way is again, these K-complexes in humans. Um, there was another thing that we found was, was, which was quite interesting uh, that uh, Mircha Steriad had also discovered. In, in rodents and in, and, in, and in cats, when you separate the low frequencies and the high frequencies, you'll notice something very interesting going on. When the low frequencies are high, the high frequencies are low. When the low frequencies are low, the high frequencies are high. There's a pattern of interdigitation. You all see this? Well, this here is the same phenomenon on a different time scale in the cortex of cats. Again, we're looking at a species that doesn't have a neocortex. So this was a bit, bit of a shock to the field to find out that the cortex was at best sufficient, but not necessary for these quote, cortical patterns. So, and, and this, this led to some, some interesting um, uh, arguments. Uh, I remember, you know, I was uh, a graduate student at the Salk Institute uh, when I did this work. This is the Salk Institute. I was incarcerated right over here. Uh, and uh, the, my mentor, um, Francis Crick, uh, who invited me to do my PhD uh, at the Salk Institute, asked me this question. He said, well, now that you've discovered this, can a bird's ability to produce REM sleep tell us anything about consciousness? So uh, to honor him after his death, I uh, uh, put together a conference at Cambridge University to really answer this question and to look at consciousness across species. Um, and so this, this occurred now 10 years ago, and we sort of did sort of a Turing test for consciousness. We looked at different brains uh, with uh, as little biases as possible. And so it turns out if you look at, you know, the weight of the brain, 
Well, the human brain is not that exceptional if we just look at, at its weight. If you look at the volume of the brain, um, what do you think? What, what is the brain on the left and what is the brain on the right? What's on the left? What do you think? I get a vote for whale. Dolphin, bottlenose dolphin. And right? Human, exactly. Now you've got uh, orca, so killer whale, human. Blue whale, human. And you can see there's a constellation of brains of different sizes and, and weights. And it turns out that the human brain, if we look at it that way, is not that unique. Except that uh, neuroscientists have come up with this metric called EQ, encephalization quotient. And what it is, is it is the, the, the size of the brain divided by the expected size of the brain given the, 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 the size of the body. And if you do that, you know, then all of a sudden, humans are back on top. That's a bit of a self-serving uh, um, metric, you know. Uh, if one were to apply this within humans, it would mean that babies are geniuses and fat people are stupid, which is not the case. Uh, but we're told that this is, this is a metric that's useful to distinguish across species. But if we do that, then we have to ask ourselves, well, where are, um, where are light birds, for example, and where are insects? And we're told not to worry about them because they don't have uh, these, these cells here, uh, von Economo neurons. When you brush your teeth, these cells are firing because they recognize you in the mirror. Uh, and, uh, but it turns out that birds actually have uh, um, the ability to recognize themselves in the mirror, magpies, for example. So we locked ourselves up in the, uh, the bathroom room at Hotel du Vin in Cambridge, and we decided that there, was, that there was time to actually admit that there was no neurobiological reason to believe that the cortex was you know, necessary for consciousness. In other words, the, 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 the part of the brain that distinguishes us the most from other species uh, may be sufficient but not necessary for behaviors for which consciousness is itself necessary. Uh, and that became known as uh, the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness. Uh, I brought the original with me to Dubai. You can have a look at it with all, it's a, with all the signatures afterwards. And it caused a, a debate all over the world um, in the 10 years uh, since its signature. Uh, the Financial Times called it a leading edge, uh, um, a, 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 the leading edge of one of the biggest modern sh day shifts in uh, human thought. Um, and basically the old idea that, you know, um, uh, animals are automata, uh, which was espoused by a number of non-neuroscientists uh, came to a crashing end. This led to laws being changed all over the world, uh, as well as to the Declaration of uh, de Toulon, uh, which pushes for uh, non-humans to be recognized as uh, non-human people. And in fact, here's another nice quote by Edison, which I think is appropriate, which is, until we stop har harming all other living beings, we're still savages. So, okay, so that was the birds, but what about other species? Well, it turns out I wasn't the first uh, to turn brainwaves into clouds. Uh, at the time I was working on this, there was another lab by um, Miguel Nicolelis, um, actually M M Miguel Nicolelis' lab at Duke that did something similar. Uh, and uh, this was on multiple channels, not one channel. Uh, the variables were not necessarily, I mean, were, were, um, were collected uh, with invasive uh, electrodes. So that was, you know, one of the, one of the problems, I guess. Um, the, with the birds, the electrodes were on the brain, not in the brain. Uh, and there are no reported agreements with manual scoring. So if you look at WT here, uh, it's, it's not weight training, it's uh, whisker switching because this is rat data. But if you want to see a rat weight training, you know, be my guest. Um, the question is, can we do this now non-invasively? And so using the, the, the method that I described before, we just put electrodes on uh, the, the, uh, the um, scalp of rats. So there was no surgery at all. Uh, this is with a typical human uh, electrode. And here we have 30 seconds um, of data for in each quadrant, uh, quiet wakefulness. So again, you have time here and microvolts over here, uh, locomotion, Land anesthesia and deep anesthesia. We put it through the algorithm, and again, now we have clusters. So we have light anesthesia in fuchsia, deep anesthesia in blue, and wakefulness is the rest. So this is all non invasive. There's no surgery at all. Okay, so then can we use this in humans? So this is, we'll, we'll, this is what we're going to discover now in the, in, the, in the last 15 minutes of the talk. So you remember this fellow here, right? So we're going to take our human EEG. 
And we're going to run this technique that I showed you before that was initially developed uh, for birds. So we have a spectrogram. Uh, we, uh, we, we do this winner take all map. And here, every dot corresponds to 30 seconds of EEG. So this is the entire night, but every, every dot here is just 30 seconds, all right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to superimpose the results of the manual scoring on the data. And the manual score, remember, has access to all these different data, the EEG, the muscle tone, um, the EKG, et cetera. And when we do that, you see that something fundamental has happened. Every single major sleep and waking state has its own signature in this map. So that's very nice because it tells us that mathematically, we can just use a single EEG. We don't need all this other stuff. If our goal is just to separate the stages. And uh, this works on American data, it works on German data, it works at the one second resolution and the 30 second resolution. Uh, it also means that now we can create algorithms and we can use this map to see, you know, where there are similarities and where there are differences. And we can do this at, at a 30 second resolution and we can do it at a one second resolution. Um, what I mean by that is we can create filters again, just like with the birds, right? So here, every dot corresponds again to 30 seconds of EEG. But this, now we have a parameter space and we have one night. So how many, how many clusters do you see here? Raise your hand if you only see one cluster. Raise your hand if you see two. Okay, two people. Raise your hand if you see three. Okay, maybe five, four. Okay, maybe 10, five. Okay, so I guess I should have given you some choices here. Uh, if you superimpose the results of the manual scoring, you see we have four. And that's great. It's again using a single channel of, of data. So here we've got three patients at the Max Planck Institute in Munich in, in Germany. All the, the scoring on top is done by the manual scorer who has access to all of the data. And here's the algorithm who has access to only to a single channel. And you can see that already in 2007, there was a very nice uh, convergence in about 60 seconds, right? And, and uh, so this was quite, quite striking. And so if we look at uh, four different patients here, in red, we have the manual scoring. In blue, we have the algorithm. And you can see that they're pretty much superimposed, even though the, the algorithm can do this in one minute, but now I'm even much, much faster, and using just a single channel. And it turns out we can do some other interesting things. We can actually look at this EEG, you know, and find out high frequencies also, just like we, like we did on the birds. So here you can see that this line here corresponds to 20 Hertz. The, these lines over here, the vertical ones, correspond to movement artifacts, which have a broadband um, signature. Well, it turns out that we can clean this up. And now we, we, we have these nice spindles that come from the thalamus. We've got cortical gamma. We have even, even ultra high gamma, even though the electrodes are not touching the brain. This is one channel, non-invasive. So what I'm telling you is that we can actually create maps of brain activity, dynamic maps, and look for signatures of brain areas using a tiny little device that you can wear at home. In fact, we've been doing it now for 12 years, and I'll tell you about this. So the, the first device um, uh, was the iBrain 1. Uh, it was the first portable brain monitor uh, uh, in, in that sense. Uh, and you know, uh, this was what it, what it looked like. Uh, companies like Roche and Novartis used it for clinical trials. So it's been on the market for 12 years now. Uh, this lady is not in the market because she's my ex fiance, but uh, she's wearing the, the Ibrin one. And the most important thing I've got to tell you about this, this, uh, this technology is that it produces very beautiful data. So this is data from one single patient. You, you see the alpha waves. You see stage one over here, you see these spindles between 12 and 15 Hertz, these beautiful Delta waves, REM sleep with the eye movements. This is unfiltered raw eye brain data, right? So clinical grade data at home. And what it means is that, you know, we don't have to now bring these people to the hospital. We can do this in a remote setting. Uh, we, can, we, we can put it on very, very easily and we can use it to look at sleep, but also at other things. So in this case, we've used it to look at the impact of uh, CNS drugs. So, and we have access to, you know, a different type of data than uh, what was done previously. So we're changing the transfer function. We're putting much less junk on the, on the head and we're collecting much more data. So uh, over the last 12 years, we have actually 
collected data from ALS, autism, drug effects, insomnia, PTSD, Rett syndrome, traumatic brain injury, and others, but I'm just going to show you a little sample. So this was a clinical trial uh, that, we, that we did with a major pharma company, and we noticed that when they applied the drug, the spindles were decreased. In other words, if you see this, this, this bar over here, the horizontal one, you notice that there are these green dots, right? You see them? After the drug, they disappear. And that's a big problem because when that happens, the likelihood that you're going to have a psychotic break actually increases. So you want to know if a drug is causing you that kind of reaction. Um, we did a test with the US Navy, which was quite interesting. Um, the, here's one example. So we calculate the, the hypnogram and you can see that this person has slow wave sleep. It's unlikely that this person suffers from Alzheimer's. Uh, there is stage two sleep. So you have the spindle. So it's unlikely that this person would have schizophrenia. And there's quite a bit of REM sleep, but not too much. So it's unlikely that this person is depressed. You can see that the, the, the person wakes up quite a bit. But if we use this dynamic spectral scoring, can we find out more information? So it turns out that we can. Um, there is a slow wave contamination of stage two that happens to people who have traumatic brain injury. Yes, there are spindles, but there is no overexpression of spindles. That happens to people who are treated with SSRIs, selective, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And the REM is especially very choppy. That happens to people who have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That patient had all three. He had uh, TBI, he had PTSD, and he was treated for depression. And when we said, well, he doesn't have depression, why are you giving the soldier an SSRI? And they said that it were use, he, he was receiving it for anxiety. We could tell this using a single night of sleep remotely. And we can do this at different resolutions as well. Uh, the nice advantage about having the same uh, system that we can use all around the world is that we can compare data. Uh, so we, we, we collected data from uh, uh, boys with autism in the United States and girls with Rett syndrome, uh, which is a form of autism, which is very lethal uh, in Europe. And uh, very often, we found a biomarker in the beta range during sleep. It's too early to call this a result, but we have been finding this across these pathologies. Um, insomnia, of course, is also very interesting to look at. We had one patient who came to us who wanted to, 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 uh, to be analyzed, and uh, we made him sign an informed consent um, document. And we found out if, when we studied him at a, at a 30 second resolution or with a, a very fast algorithm that this poor fellow was sleeping 1.4 minutes at a time. And the longest amount of sleep that he had uh, uninterrupted was 18 minutes. So he was actually dying. Uh, we sent him to the hospital, they reproduced uh, this finding and they just reset his circadian rhythm with a light bulb. And then we hired him actually. So uh, by the time he came to see us, he actually had gotten into a car accident. So, what does this have to do with um, communication and with, a, with ALS? So in the last seven minutes, I will, I will tell you. Um, so this is, this is Stephen Hawking and I at the Met uh, in New York in 2010. And uh, Stephen saw our data and he decided he wanted to actually join the company, which he did before, before his death. And he wanted to be involved in a, a research study. And so we created an entire uh, research program for ALS uh, and for people who cannot communicate in honor of Stephen. And even though Stephen has passed, we have continued and we have some interesting results. So this is Stephen in his kitchen in Cambridge uh, with iBrain One. Uh, I had come to see him and I asked him, you know, when do you want to start? And he said, right now. So uh, I, I put the device on him and I did something quite cruel to him. I asked him to imagine that he could move, that he could squeeze his right hand, squeeze his left hand, squeeze his uh, right foot and left foot, which he couldn't do, of course, but I wanted him to imagine that. We also uh, asked him um, in a subsequent um, uh, test, very weird questions. We asked him if he was born in Argentina, if he had a pet giraffe, and because we wanted to look at his brain when he was startled to see uh, you know, what, what the biomarkers looked like. And, um, Oops, here's what we found, which was quite interesting and which we then discovered in other ALS sufferers as well. So on the left is a traditional EEG analysis, right? The, the spectrograms that I showed you before. On the right is, is our method. Here, Stephen is resting. When we ask him to imagine that he can squeeze his right hand, you see this broad pattern of activation over here, right? We see this also uh, when we ask him to squeeze his right foot or his left foot, which he couldn't physically do. 
And uh, when we ask him to open and close his eyes, this happens as well. In fact, this happens exactly at a time we would ask him to do things or to imagine things. In green is when we ask him to begin the intent. In red is when we ask him to end the intent. And you see these peaks, these detections are happening right in between. And here, you can see this with the right hand, right? This person is not moving. You're looking at the first neural correlates, right, of intention. The person is not moving. Left foot, right foot, left hand. And we, we reported that already, you know, a number of years ago. Then we worked with Augie Nieto, another ALS sufferer. And we decided to see if we could use this technology to help him communicate. So in fact, on May 21st, 2013, he actually became the first per ALS sufferer using this technology to spell. And he, he spelled the word communicate. This here is Augie using iBrain2. In, in this case, we're actually using his muscle movements as well. And we're asking him to spell. So he starts with F. So we were a little worried. Then O. He's spelling a very important word if you are paralyzed or close to being paralyzed. He, he did an R, so he, which he's going to remove. So F, O, O. What word do you think he's spelling? Food. Right, F, O, O, D. Okay. So we, we have a faster system now um, where we, we um, uh, can move as quickly as people can actually imagine that, that they are moving uh, left or right. And this is, yeah, I, I guess I can show it in the Q&A given that uh, just a couple of minutes left. And here, if we add another channel, you can see that the signature between left hand and the right hand becomes, you know, very, 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 uh, they become very different. This is Elon Musk here using iBrain1. Um, and uh, so I thought this is quite interesting, you know, given that we have access to all this, this, this resolution here, maybe we can make the device smaller. And in fact, you know, we can. So this is Elon wearing a prototype of, uh, of the iBrain3. Uh, now, Elon did not design this, you know, he's, he's, he's a shareholder and an old friend. Uh, he's not involved in the science of NeuroVigil. Um, but the iBrain3 is smaller than your car keys. Uh, this is, you know, another prototype. Uh, it can uh, send it out to your phone in real time, and we can use it, you know, in senior care centers, even though there's a very small footprint. And we have an app uh, that works for iOS and for Android. So your physician has access to your brain data, wherever you might be, whether you're a soldier in the field or, or elsewhere, uh, we can look at, at your, brain, your brain data and see the, the impact that your drugs are having. So we have a, another Swiss pharma company. We've worked with Roche and Novartis. Uh, we have a third one that wants to use now iBrain3 for ALS, for brain cancer and Parkinson's. And then we have an ICU in Switzerland that wants to use it for depression, drug reaction, fitness, and communication. Uh, because right now what they use for all these people who have been intubated is, is rather you know, primitive, if I may say so. There's another place that's interested in exactly those applications. And that's the International uh, Space Station. Um, uh, and for the Mars mission as well, we want to have access to real-time data from, uh, from all of these astronauts. And when I created my company, I was very lucky that I was able to rally a very great group of people. Uh, some of them, unfortunately, have passed. Uh, now we are you know, at, a, at an infection point in our, in our company, and we, we have a, a growth team, uh, includes you know, Dr. Gabriel Vargas, who was uh, head of neuroscience biomarkers at Roche. Uh, we have Hans-Peter Gertz from Roche and from Novartis, Noam Ziff, who is VP of Technology at Qualcomm and other luminaries. Uh, and we are scaling operations and we're building a Manhattan project for the brain. And so in the last minute or two, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So we have a clinical trial facility in Wyoming. Uh, we will launch iBrain3 for ALS uh, in Philadelphia. We signed a partnership with the University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, we have an accelerator in San Diego. Uh, and law firms also in, um, in Boston and in Washington, D.C. that are part of this conglomerate. Uh, we're negotiating right now with MIT and with Johns Hopkins. Uh, and the idea is to bring some of the top institutions in the world and work with them to accelerate uh, in a, the, the, the pace at which innovations can go into the market for new technology. 
so you know we we have support uh, from you know Wyoming. This is sort of, this is where this is this is Wyoming is to this this project what um, New Mexico was to the actual Manhattan projects, where a lot of the new technologies will go. The U.S. Congress has backed this. Uh, a previous administration who was already very much behind it uh, ever since they did the, the BRIN initiative. Uh, the city of San Diego wants to be formally part of it. We've been negotiating with Montreal uh, as well. Uh, and, we'll, and they wrote a letter to uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We'll see if, uh, if Canada becomes formally involved. Uh, but as I said, we, we are working already with the University of Waterloo. And I'll leave you with this one quote uh, from one of my PhD co-advisors. Uh, he was asked to predict the future within 50 years. And he said, within 50 years, neuroscientists, with the help uh, from other disciplines, will have developed a non-invasive device that measures brain activity in real time in free living humans over long distances for indefinite periods. This device will allow scientists and clinicians to study such complex processes as, as attention, perception, and consciousness at their most fundamental levels. This basic understanding will lead to new approaches to developing therapies for cognitive diseases such as schizophrenia, autism, depression, and Alzheimer's. Uh, a recently, um, Rusty Gage, who's now the president of the Salk Institute, looked at this quote and he said, there's one thing wrong with it. Can you guess what it is? At the time, it's not 50 years, we're doing this right now. Thank you very much for your attention.